welcome you again uh, to a, the second part of the video presentations on the Battle for the Beach. We did the 1980s in September. Uh, we will do the 1990s uh, today uh, with a brief glimpse of what is occurring actually just to the north of us that we're living through currently. So uh, it's a, uh, a world that we, on one hand, we have a cycle of crises. On another hand, uh, we're living in the midst of a, uh, we hope maybe the uh, worst e era uh, and year uh, in our 21st century. So I welcome all of you. Thank you for coming. I want to call your attention to the exhibit that we just put up uh, yesterday. Uh, it is a continuation of the third battle uh, to, to save, the, uh, save the beach. And so uh, Jake Just from the Poco Museum was re largely responsible for getting it designed and uh, installed yesterday. So it's not complete, but you can be looking at it over the coming year, both here as well as at the Historical Society. As we begin today, I trust that uh, my clicking ability, I took lessons, <laughs> and then I had to take more lessons, but I think we have it down. And if we don't, I have John Wilhelm uh, here at the computer. Now we're just praying that the computer continues to work, the bulb in the projector works, and we will move forward. Again, I want to give many thanks to all those individuals who have been involved in saving our past. We have collections at the Hourglass Museum that have come from organizations as well as uh, newspaper clippings, uh, but particularly donations by Jim Hummy and Tristan but, uh, Buzz Lee, and more recently Paul Panther, Duncan Hines, and then of course many, many others. We also have photos, and again, we cannot tell a story without the photos. And again, most recently, Duncan Hines, Paul Panther, uh, had uh, donated and given us copies that we, our photos that we made, as well as many others in the past, Kathy Kinney especially, sort of, who was a neighbor who lived through this in the 1970s and 1980s on the shore, on Lake Shore Drive, on Shore Drive, and she took a lot of photos, and so we thank her as well as many others. Uh, we also had, I had the opportunity to interview Paul Panther, Duncan Hines, Greg Groh, and John Hannon, and then uh, this story would not have been able to be told if we didn't have the newspaper articles that appeared, particularly in the Portage Press, the Weekly, Courtney Van Lopik, largely in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, documented the history of our battle to save the beach, as well as Joyce Russell, who was a uh, reporter, I guess assigned almost full time to Ogden Dunes uh, in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, with the uh, Northwest Indiana, first the Gary Post and then the Northwest Indiana Times. Uh, thank Mary Jo. Uh, and John Wilhelm for proofreading uh, the, ma the booklet that we will be uh, finalizing and then uh, being offered for sale. It'll be about a 100-page booklet with photos uh, that will document the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. Uh, uh, Joyce uh, Russell also is uh, still active, still involved. Uh, she was good enough to look through uh, the 1980s, 1990s sections of the, of the uh, co coming manuscript. And then uh, certainly today's program, Barbara Schultz, members of the, the, the worst, the members of the board, and uh, Dorothy Kurtz, of course, had put uh, the groundwork for this, and especially for Dan Manis for what he has done. And, and he got rid of all the clicks. So, <laughs> thank you especially for that. We'll start today looking at the, we'll look at the 1990s. I just want to call your attention to uh, 
about six, nine months ago, we did the first chapter of the story in our newsletter, the, uh, the Hourglass newsletter for the Historical Society. It covered the 1970s. And then the 1980s we did on uh, September 15th. But I want to emphasize that the major battle in the 1970s dealt with trying to protect the beach from being taken over by the National Park from our standpoint. And it ultimately resulted in a compromise that a walking uh, easement was granted and recognized by the National Lakeshore, National Park Service at the time, as well as signed off by uh, uh, the town council here in Ogden Dunes. And so that was a major, major sort of feeling of fear. Uh, we also had some storms in the 70s that were preludes of what came in the 80s and the 90s. And then in the 1980s, uh, the, you know, with the search for solutions. And one of the major solutions that generated a lot of divisiveness in the town were the groins. And I think you've seen the groins more recently uh, as they have come to the surface uh, uh, along the, the shore. But the groins were supposed to be the solution. They would capture the sand and keep the sand from going back out. Well, obviously, it did not work. And so then we have, as we will look in the 1990s, and of course today, we'll look at the steel walls and the rock revetments as ways of protecting uh, the shoreline. But I want to take a look at, at this graph. I know it may be difficult to see in the back, but this is a 200-year graph. And you can sort of see the rise and the fall of lake levels. And especially you would see, you know, 1838, 500, almost 585 feet, the lake level above sea level. And here in 219, you would see here, but it's to 220, it's up here. 1986 was the highest in the 20th, in the 20th century, right here. So, uh, you know, today we have more than matched that record of the 20th century. And then this is another graph that simply gives you some sense. And the blue lines, as you see here, uh, these are uh, the average is in the summertime, 578, and here is 577, uh, 579, and 578 as the average. And you could see what we will be talking about here is we have 1997, and then after 1997, 1998, the lake levels fell below average. And this ends in 2012, and all was fine. But of course, if we extend this, this is where we would be today. Also, one of the issues, of course, that we have become very familiar with is literal drift, the literal drift that takes sand from our beach, moves it to the west. When there's no impediments in this natural process, our beach would be replenished by sand that we would be moving from our eastern neighbors to, to our beach. And so it would just flow. And this was a, a, a graph that showed 9, 2008, you can see at the bottom, 1987 and 1967. And of course, that's the shoreline in 1967. Uh, was before building of the steel mills and the port of Indiana. And so because of the Bethlehem steel, Midwest steel, and particularly the port, the sand builds up before the port, before US steel, or Bethlehem steel. And today we would probably see the build up another you know, 30, 40 feet. So that's where the sand that would normally come to Ogden Dunes comes, you know, has been impeded. 1988-1992, lake levels dropped. 
From 92 to 96, they began to rise. Storms brought more damage to the shoreline. Also in 1992, we had Congress passing an, an additional uh, appropriation to expand the National Lakeshore. And in that expansion, Ogden Dunes lost some property uh, just sort of uh, east of Inland Marsh, uh, north, uh, south of US-12, a little west of the gas station. Also in 1992, you had a presidential election. And of course, you had uh, George Bush winning Ogden Dunes, Bill Clinton more than doubling Bill Clinton's. Uh, but what's interesting in the 1992 election was Peter Vosklosky, uh won Ogden Dunes, 482 to 425. Uh, you know, that should have been maybe a helpful sign for us, but it wasn't, didn't work out quite that way. <laughs> and so I just want to go through a few slides beginning to show the damage that is being accumulated as the lake levels rise and as the lack of beach replenishment occurs and the storms come in. So these are, uh, I should also mention in uh, 1992, the Historical Society of Ogden Dunes was, had been recently formed and had been given a home. And uh, this is the Hourglass Cottage on Lupin Lane, donated to uh, the Historical Society in the community of Ogden Dunes by Sue Mechtersheimer, uh, a longtime resident and a realtor, as well as a former principal and, and uh, teacher in the Chicago public school systems. And so, uh, obviously, the Historical Society and the, and the community of Ogden Dunes should be thankful uh, for uh, Sue making this gift uh, shortly before she died. Here again, you begin to see the removal of those famous groins that were so important in the 1980s. They were being removed and put up against the dune, trying to protect and stabilize the sand along uh, the lot lines of the people who lived on Shore Drive. And then in 1993, the council elected Trustman Buzz Lee as president. He lived at 34 Shore Drive, he had been very active in the battles to save the beach in the 1970s and 1980s. And he was elected council president. And what he had, as I call it, is velvet glove and the iron fist approach. And so he revived the lawsuits, but he also initiated friendly discussions with the Port of Indiana and the Army Corps of Engineers. And he reminded the residents of Ogden Dunes, quote, one house going into the lake will affect all the property values in Ogden Dunes. And of course, you know, he knew the lake was rising. 1993, the storms again hit the east end, especially damaging the east end. Uh, even though the lake level was still nearly two feet below the highs of 1986-87. He also entered into a consent decree between the town and the port of Indiana. Ogden Dunes would end its litigation against the port. And the port then agreed to give Ogden Dunes $300,000 to pr purchase a dredging machine. It gave us also a small boat that was valued supposedly at $15,000 and then $16,000 a year for seven years to operate and maintain the dredge. Now, you know, that seemed like it was going to work, but it was soon evident that you did not buy much of a dredge for $300,000 and it would take a lot more to operate than uh, simply $16,000 a year. And so, you know, that sort of didn't, that, that dream of solution didn't last very long. But it, it had a goodwill effect for a time because the state also then uh, gave a grant to Ogden Dunes because they were beginning to dredge for the marinas uh, that were being built. Uh, uh, and so the state also provided a grant to move sand from the dredging of the marinas uh, uh, along the ditch, waterway. And, uh, and so you could see here the coming of sand 
via the state, via the dredging for the marinas. And then you begin to have the series of storms. But there also in 93, there was another issue that arose because Portage wanted to create a gambling resort center as a, in our southeast corner. I mean, our neighbors would be a southeast corner, where the marinas now are. So there was going to be a gambling resort along Burns Waterway. Uh, however, it was voted down by the voters of Porter County. But you could see an image of, can you imagine, you know, having this resort and casino over here? Uh, and then you had, again, more storms. Here is uh, Six Shore Drive, uh, the Suarez home. Uh, uh, it's the third home uh, to the east. Uh, and uh, you could see they had used railroad ties to protect their home. And of course, the storms just pulled out those railroad ties. And again, you see some of the damage created by the 1994 storms. And again, that you have, you have the groins. You can sort of see the groins have been uncovered along the shoreline. Again, you have now in 94, 95, the solution came to be steel walls. And so you begin to see now the construction of steel walls uh, in the mid 1990s. And again, you see down on the, particularly on the east end, you can see the construction and the tie backs. Here is the, uh, the corner, Two Shore Drive, uh, which was the far eastern corner of Ogden Dunes. Uh, the, as you know, that, that wall runs east-west, and there's also a north-south part of the wall. 1995, the community met. There was a meeting, and uh, Army Corps of Engineers came and had some discussion and some give and take. And again, there was some hope, because the Army Corps uh, spokesperson was talking about uh, a slurry system. Uh, and if any of you have been down to Portage Beach over the last three or four weeks, you would see the dredging machine taking sand out of the lake and slurrying it onto shore. And so uh, that was sound like a great idea. Of course, it's rather expensive. But the point was that was a way of moving the sand uh, quickly onto shore. And uh, so there was some discussion. And also what was, has happened then and then continues to happen, uh, NIPSCO has to dredge out sand from its around the Bailey generator. And they had to do something with the sand. Uh, they would like to just push it further out in the lake, but they're required to dump it uh, off of the shore of Ogden Dunes and Beverly Shores. And so you would see, we have seen it every summer, the barges coming in and dumping the sand into the lake. The only problem is for Ogden Dunes is the fact that they're dumping it too far out. Uh, but because of the barge loaded down, it cannot get close in. Uh, and instead of by building, you know, getting a more expensive barge to allow it to come in and, and dump the sand closer, where we would have, a greater, would have a greater impact upon our shoreline and our beach, but that continues uh, during the summer. So there's four, there were 50 barges in 1995, 43,000 cubic yards of sand. Then discussions began to be uh, held with uh, Representative Peter Vaslowski, because obviously he has been a long and uh, very, very effective congressman for most of his congressional districts. And, and so the, pro the proposal was, and the discussions were, Blaskowski said, well, if Ogden Dunes wants to have some entry into federal funds to pay for the sand that's going to be nourishing our beach, there has to be a study first. And so he started discussing with Ogden Dunes, the council, uh, some of the, the concerned citizens uh, about a, 
uh, putting together a plan. He would take a, make a proposal to the National Park Service uh, and to the appropriation uh, or the Army Corps of Engineers appropriation, but they had to be a $400,000 study to exactly to see what was all that was necessary. There have been a lot of studies, but this is the only way you could get into that pipeline of federal funds, is to have a thorough study. The study would come up with supposedly the recommendation that the solution is beach nourishment, and federal funds would be available to pay for that annual beach nourishment. So those discussions began in 95. And so Jack Hinman especially, uh, some of you recall that who have been here a long time, uh, he was very, very active in all of this, and he sort of led the charge uh, for, for the Concerned Citizens uh, Committee, and uh, Buzz Lee was the president of the town council, and so they were involved in generating, you know, a proposal, trying to get support for th this to happen. Also in November, you had storms again destroying the, particularly the East End. And again, you see the groins being uncovered. But there was also a moment of happiness and pride because Carson Cunningham, a young man from Ogden Dunes, was almost a, sort of a Indiana basketball star. And he was leading Andre into a great and successful uh, 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 year. And uh, they won the uh, winter tournament uh, uh, playing Gary Roosevelt. So uh, Carson Cunningham brought a lot of pride, took the mi your mind off of uh, the storms and the damages that were occurring. Now came the change of plan. Uh, Tristan Buzz Lee, who had negotiated the $300,000 plus dollars with the uh, Port of Indiana, he had, had thought he was on with goodwill with the governor, uh, and discovering, of course, that the dredge would not work. We, you did not buy much of a dredge for $300,000. So, came up with the idea that there was a New York law firm, Solomon and others, that had been very successful in suing the Army Corps of Engineers and getting large settlements uh, to protect coastal communities along the Atlantic coastline because of various actions that had been taken by the government on the recommendation of the Army Corps that, in a sense, created more damage uh, to the coastline. And so Solomon and others was a major New York law firm. So we were going big time. I mean, we had lawsuits before, they didn't get very far, but we thought this was a real opportunity. And Lee says, we have this $300,000. And so this will be our, you know, sort of our bank, bank account to move forward. Now, of course, you have to recognize this is not going to endear Ogden Dunes to the Port of Indiana, because what we, we're going to do is sue the Port of Indiana again, not the town, because the town had already set a, a consent decree where they accepted the money. But the, the residents hadn't, so that the residents could sue uh, the Port of Indiana, that is the state of Indiana. And so you can see it, sort of relationships are not going to go well into the future because we're using their own money to sue them. That, you know, that doesn't sit very well. But John O'Connell was the attorney that was assigned to Ogden to count. So he worked very carefully, closely with uh, the Ogden's community. They were seeking four to six million dollars for immediate nourishment, plus 40, 50 million over the long term. So they, what they were attempting to do was to get into the federal pipeline by way of going to court, it's suing. The first phase was going to be 30 to 50,000. And Ogden Dunes thought and hoped 
that by having this high-powered New York law firm and having a strong case from our standpoint that the Army Corps would settle. The port, you know, the port of Indiana, they, they would come to the table to, to reach an agreement without having to go to trial. Because going from the first phase, seeking the out-of-court settlement, to the second phase was going to cost three, four hundred thousand dollars. And so that also, besides then the 300,000 that we had in the bank, uh, fundraising began to occur at, by the Concerned Citizens Committees. The Lees, the Valentines, Jack Hinman, uh, seeking then donations, $500 from the sh uh, lakefront owners, $200 from residents living on the south side of Shore Drive, and $100 from all other residents to revive the lawsuits and asking the residents to become participate, become part of the, those who are suing because the town could not sue the Port of Indiana. So the, but the residents could. And so that was the, you know, the iron fist, the legal action, and the hopes that we would come out with a solution. A new council was elected. There were five new members, Duncan Hines, John Worth, Bill Eichhorn, Pap Stiglick, and Brenda Cofield. Uh, this photo, and Jackie Rimmers was a uh, clerk. Uh, Cofield was, lived on Shore Drive, the south side of Shore Drive. Uh, she was an attorney uh, in Chicago. Bill, Bill Eichhorn became president. And so uh, this was a new group ready to take on uh, the big boys. And so again, we see a graph from 1996 to May of 2016. And again, you can get the image of where we were after 1998. Uh, you see right here, these, were, these are going to be the two disaster years, 1997, 1998 for Ogden Dunes. But you can see what happened after that. Of course, we get down here, and then we had, you know, to about 2014, we were below average all through that period. Then, of course, in November of 14, we went above average, and then we 15, then down, and then 16, and then we're up here again now. So, this again shows you what's happening. Summer update in August of 28, Hinman, Buzz Lee uh, were reporting out to the community. No progress in an out of court settlement. It's not going to be a neat cakewalk for us to uh, win this battle. And 168 residents joined, with 95 joined the lawsuit, put their names down. It's part of those who are suing uh, the steel mills, the port, uh, the Army Corps, and 168 residents donated a total of $34,000. The storms came again, and again you see the damage that is being done. Damage in, 90s, you know, in the storm of February, March, 97. This was the Kratz Boathouse. Uh, again, you see the uncovering of the groins here. And here were the sort of uh, uh, wooden boxes that were, again, the idea was to capture and keep the sand from disappearing. And you see even some of the early stages of rock revetments as a solution. And again, you see this is in uh, 97, February, March. Those are bad months uh, for Ogden Dunes. Again, you see damage on the Far East End in terms of the destruction uh, that the storm did. This was before the steel walls, but the steel walls are going to be quickly uh, uh, installed. But again, this is uh, the Suarez house down on the uh, east end, 6th uh, Shore Drive. 
see the damage to the dune, the lack of beach, uh, the failure of earlier attempts at walling and protecting property. There's a bird's eye view, it's not a very good photo, but what it represents in the spring of 97, the storms were bad. We failed to uh, reach an out of, out of court settlement, which meant we had to go to trial, we had to go to court, and this is, now we're eating into the, the $300,000 that we had set aside. And so we hope now that the trial would go better than the, the negotiations for an out of court settlement. Uh, there was failure in the federal courts, uh, kept moving us around from Hammond then to South Bend. Uh, again, you see more damage in the March storms of 1997. You can hear you had visits from the state. Uh, Bill Suarez is leading uh, some of the state delegation to show them all the damage. And again, you begin to see the steel piling walls are being installed to protect property. And this is just a series of steel walls, particularly on the east end. So this was the summer of 1997, those you could remember. Again, you see groins, you see some of the rock revetments. You still see a stairway that goes down into the lake. Of course, today we no longer have that stairway going down to the lake. And you see, looking west, that the shoreline had almost disappeared. There was a big fundraiser in uh, August 31st, 1997, and uh, nearly 600 people attended. Here's another, but you could see the difficulty of having a fundraiser on the beach. There was no beach. So 250 t-shirts were sold, $8,000 was raised to help support the lawsuits. There was now some success, and you know, so things maybe were looking a little bit up in, in, uh, in uh, the autumn of 97. State Senator Ruth Antich became a, a strong voice uh, uh, using her influence, what little she had since she was a Democrat, dealing with the Indiana uh, Republican-controlled uh, legislature. But she was able to get a $250,000 state emergency grant because of the damage that was being done. And that was to allow, uh, help pay for seawalls on the east end. Five or six homes were protected, but steel walls that were paid for by the state. However, her big attempt was to get $5 million of state funding, but she failed in that. At the same time, we began to re receive some favorable press with some long articles giving the history of our battles, the failure of government to fund, uh, even though it was assumed that, it was believed that the government had assumed responsibility. The federal government and then the state government supposedly took responsibility from the federal government for any damage that would be, occur because of the building of the port of Indiana. Because you put the port out, sand comes up, and it stops. And so what sand used to reach Ogden Dunes no longer could. So uh, you know, it, was, it made it sense to us, a good argument. However, it wasn't being bought very, you know, uh, received very well in the courts. But we were getting some favor, we were getting some sympathy from the larger public. An example of this was a uh, cartoon. Uh, and here you see Ogden Dunes, the little girl building her sand castle. And you see the Port of Indiana taking a bucket of water and dumping it on top of the little girl's sand castle. And you see the Army Corps of Engineers standing beside his friend who is dumping the water, tee hee hee, and laughing at what is occurring. So, you know, it was a cartoon that was to get us some sympathy. So it was at least a good sign in terms of raising public awareness. Uh, 
more importantly, what was occurring was that Duncan Hines and others put together a one about an inch binder filled with data and filled with uh, information that was going to be used for our public relations campaign and to try to you know, convince uh, federal and state authorities uh, that they had some responsibility. And so you could see one of these were these uh, dual p photos. You can't, it's not a great photo, two great photos, but it was Jim Copp sitting in 1975 along the shoreline by uh, Kratz's home, now Stirk's home, uh, you know, enjoying a wide beach. And then in 1997, now sitting without a beach at all. And so there was a series of photos, you know, sort of before and after. And particularly what was a, a concern to what had happened in the mid-1980s, as we know, what we see today as Portage Beach and the fishing piers that are going out into the lake, those did not exist until uh, uh, the 19, after 1985. And so, uh, you know, so that what we have here is now documentation of, you know, the problems that Ogden Dunes is facing. Another thing I mentioned, uh, I think, at the last uh, session in September, uh, a, collected, uh, a collection of, of data that went into this booklet. And this is a, just an example. This was done, it was added to the booklet, done in 1999. But it took every home along the shoreline, identifying then uh, uh, the protection system, steel piling walls, groins, railroad tie wall, railroad tie wall, groins, concrete block wall, for every home. So trying to document what's been the history of attempting to protect the shoreline. So there was a positive momentum. Uh, council leadership, Bill Eichhorn, president, 97, and then he turned over the presidency to uh, Duncan Hines. Uh, the Concerned Citizens Committee to Beach Nourishment changed its name to the Beach Nourishment Advisory Committee. Jack Hin Hinman was a, played a leading role in that uh, later uh, when Jack became ill. Uh, Tom Dogan. You had a public relations committee with Melanie Seaver, Nancy Johnson, Judith Stiles, Dorothy Kurtz, Jim Cobb. And the was, quote, we have to educate the public at large. If the public understands, and they will rally behind the cause, arguing that the government's federal and state government had underestimated the loss of sand. When the, when the original Army Corps study was done, in looking at the port of Indiana. They recognized that there would be loss of sand because of the in intercepting the littoral drift. And so, and the thought was that Ogden Dunes would lose 27,000 cubic yards of sand a year. And so, you know, so that was one of the reasons why, uh, you know, NIPSCO was going to be dropping sand down because they were part of this stopping of the uh, drifting of the sand. So it was 27,000 cubic yards. Well, that's not a whole lot. The reality was that more studies were done, not by the Army Corps or the state, but that the loss we estimate today is at least 100,000 cubic yards is lost annually from our beach. And now somebody had mentioned the last session, you know, two months ago we talked about, so it's not only sort of the, you know, the sand that's on the shoreline, but that over time there's a, there had been a series of sandbars that formed sort of naturally out into the lake. And because, again, of the impediments and the stopping of the littoral drift, that those sandbars have disappeared. And so that means that the loss of sand along the shoreline is going to go at an accelerated rate because some of that sand had been, you know, it was the sandbars had lost sand instead of the shoreline. 
Well, now we did not have those sandbars to protect us. And so, uh, the, and then our discussions with the Sclossi's office on federal funds, they were moving forward. The good news was that the lake dropped eight inches in 97 from what it was in 96. The bad news was that the walking beach was disappearing even more. They sort of measured it by, it was reduced from 50 Shore Drive to the West End. All of a sudden now the only walking beach was from 70 Shore Drive to the West End. And of course now what we know it's at what? A minus 100 feet uh, going west. Then came, those of you who were here in March of 1998, remember the great storm, March 8th and 9th of 1998. Electricity was lost. Individuals who were trying to get into Ogden Dunes from work had difficulty coming in. Uh, it was a real disaster. And these are a couple of the photos taken from. And I you know, if, don't recall, I mean, today, if you go down, you see that inner Duno pond that has been created just south of the pavilion down at the Portage Beach. In other words, that had been broken through and been added to uh, as an inner Duno pond. I don't know if you remember in 1998 that right here, that was a big dune. The water had washed all the way to the famous sledding blowout that sits to the uh, east of Ogden Dunes. And that the water went into that blowout because the storm was so powerful. You could sort of see. And just as today, of course, you can go down. But taking a look at where the water came through over here. This was part of that storm of 1980. Here's that corner lot, Two Shore Drive. <coughs> See the pier steel that I mentioned going east-west and then going north-south in the corner. A deal was going to be made. Pesklowski's, and what was unfortunate largely was the fact that Pesklowski, he did not meet with Ogden Dunes. He had his chief of staff, Chuck Brimmer, met continually with the Ogden Dunes people. And so he was sort of to the sideline. Ogden Dunes didn't feel that they were really conversing directly with him, with Pesklowski. And so what happened then, you have the deal was struck. Pesklowski would put into the appeal to the government a, a proposal for $400,000 that would provide a detailed study and that would give us, get us into the pipeline of ongoing beach nourishment that could amount to 200, two, could amount to $20 million uh, over a period of a number of years. What was required, however, was that there had to be public access. The public had to have a feeling that it was their beach too. That Vesklowski felt he could not justify going to Congress and saying, I want $25 million for this private beach community. So he said, you're going to have to give some evidence of public access. And that required a 10-car public lot on the west of Shore Drive, close to the pumping station. It's on the, it would be on National Park property, but it would be accessed through Shore Drive. So there would be a 10-car lot on the west end. And then, originally, there would be a 10-car lot on the east end at Two Shore Drive, that vacant lot. And that was to be temporary because the idea was that the state of Indiana would buy land from Midwest Steel, east or west of Burns Waterway, and they would build a road there and a parking lot so that the fishermen 
who wanted to fish off the fishing pier could have access to it. But until the state concluded that deal, there would be a 10-car lot on the east end of Ogden Dunes on Two Shore Drive. Then, of course, there would be a hiking, biking trail along the sand track, and then it would connect with Boat Club Road, and Boat Club Road would connect with the new road that the state would build to the breakwater. And so it would be a reopening of the Boat Club Road, new parking lot, then ultimately at the fishing pier. In addition, there would be a stoplight uh, and safer access into Ogden Dunes on Hillcrest and US 12. But that was the deal that Vesklosky said. He said, I need some cover. I cannot go to appropriations and ask for a blank check for a private community. So this is, again, what uh, Duncan Hines sent a letter to the residents indicating this is the, sort of the deal. There was a big meeting here in this room, or the predecessor of this room, on April 20th. Capacity crowd, 150 people sitting here. 50 people were next door in the fire. They moved out the fire trucks. Uh, the cable TV, people were watching it from home on the Ogden News Channel. And there were the pros. This would be a permanent solution, providing ongoing beach nourishment. Dan Toomey, a young, younger resident who lived on the south side of Shore Drive, spoke in favor of the agreement, as well as many others, but he was quoted in the newspaper. Those who were against that said, it's going to destroy our character. It's going, we're going to be bringing in outsiders. And Mel Trock, a long time track a long time and highly respected resident argued the access requirement would bring permanent damage to the community. So the community was divided about this deal. And so you had then the next day, the omens were now turning against us. Federal District Court in South Bend rejected the lawsuit against all, the, all defendants. Then became a war of blame, a war of words. Uh, the Suarez sent letters to the residents asking, join us in a new lawsuit. We've been duped again. We've been promised and it's been failed. Former town officials, uh, Jim, Ka Jim Hummey, Jim Cobb, Frank Stimson, Bill Cunningham, Buzz Lee, Jack Hinnon, others, Dwayne uh, Hibbs, Steve Granfield, Tom Hill, sent a letter supporting the deal. This is our, this is our hope. And so Joyce Russell said, wall-to-wall -wall protection. Residents continue to sink money into rock and steel to protect their homes. So she was saying, you know, this is a deal, but because a lot of money is being spent and it's not getting us very far. There was a survey. 337 responses said, go for the deal. But a third of the responses were opposed to the deal. So that's a large minority speaking out against at the same time, whatever, is that the lake level is beginning to drop. Now we have a second beach fundraiser. But you can see the beach now in 1998 is much wider than in 1997. The, the conversations go on. Jack Hinman dies, as I mentioned, uh, in January 1999. Uh, now Tom Dogan and Duncan Hines are sort of working with Chuck Bremer to try to come up with a solution. The state, however, then begins to back out. Midwest Steel wanted too much money for that sale of land over there, and the state didn't want to pay it. So the state backed out. So it meant then that the lot on the east end for 10 cars now became a lot for 24 cars and would be permanent because originally the idea was it'd be temporary. It would be until the state was able to build a parking lot. A new plan was proposed. Now again, now this two, two, you know, two lots, I mean two parking lots, one on the west end for 10 cars and then one on the east end now for 24 cars. 
And Duncan Hines, Tom Dogan, you know, accepted it. They said, you know, we still have to move forward with this, even though the, the ground rules have changed somewhat. But again, another, another meeting, uh, John O'Connell, the attorney that, from New York, is in town, he, and there's more opposition to parking, uh, and O'Connell tells the residents, go to trial, and you would not get as good as this. So he's telling the residents, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to, even if you win at trial, you're not going to get any better than what they're talking about currently. So what was happening was that both sides felt that the other side was changing the rules of the game. Visklowski felt Ogden Dunes was changing what was agreed to. Ogden Dunes felt that Vesklosky and others were changing the rules. So there was local opposition to the 24-car lot at the east end. Also, it appears that there's other residents in Ogden Dunes who had uh, more of an in, direct contact with Vesklosky, and they convinced Vesklosky, you know, that's not a good idea to put that down there close to us where we have our, where, where we live. We don't want to be looking at a parking lot. And so the residents, there were some residents who had a little more influence with Vesklosky than Hines and Tom Dogan. But the state then, Vesklosky comes back and says, Frank O'Bannon, the governor of the state of Indiana, and I, we come to a solution that should make everybody happy. We'll build a 60-car lot by Kratz Field. It could be used then by all Ogden Dunes residents when they're playing soccer, watching their kids, but it'll be a 60-car lot. And from Memorial Day to Labor Day, it'll be open to the public. That is, public could come in and park there. And there would be a bus that would run from that parking lot to Shore Drive to take those non-residents who were parking at the 60-car lot uh, down to the lake. And so the state would pay for the new building. It would have all kinds of amenities, would pay for the parking lot. Uh, the state would pay for the bus, and it would, Ogden Dunes could use the $16,000 that it would have annually for the dredger. They could use it to run the bus. And so, Again, big meeting. Town residents rejected the new proposal, uh, and the council rejected the proposal. And Hines wrote, we have reached a peaceful consensus with the major vast majority of residents on a very divisive issue, and that is, we will accept the two lots, 10 and 24. Hines then goes, meets with Brimmer in Washington, and Bremer tells Heinz the two-car lot is off the table. There's only one solution, and that is a 60-car lot with the bus. And Heinz even said, well, the town will buy the, because I, the, according to the governor, was that the governor, the state of Indiana, tried to buy the lot because down there at Two Shore Drive for $600,000. They wanted, to, the state didn't want to pay the $600,000. Hines said, well, I could maybe use him and Main, condemn it, and we, town would buy it for $300,000. Trying to ensure that, you know, taking this bus off the table, because the bus was very fearful. It was pointed out that, that they had tried this, the National Park had, service had tried the same thing in, in Beverly Shores from the campground down to the uh, uh, shore with a bus and it failed. It just didn't generate any, so in other words they had a bus but no one used it. And so, you know, the thought was that what we should accept the bus because after a year or two, you know, the bus will be, have very few people using it. Then comes the next great challenge. There's a new council, Julia Hohen, 
Tom Clouser, Paul Panther, Greg Grove, join Duncan Hines. Duncan becomes uh, his president. And they are going to try to convince Bremer and Voskoski to go back to the two lot solution. Lake levels are dropping. There's more sand being brought into uh, on Ogden Dunes Beach because there are dredging Burns Waterway. Remember that when you had that enormous amount of sand that was dumped on what is today used to be Portage Beach, no longer beach, but that sand would go way out because it was being dredged, slurried into, and then of course the literal drift works for Ognoon's favor. Any sand that's dumped on Portage Beach comes to us ultimately. It doesn't stay very long, it moves on down to Miller. But then, what happens? An anonymous donor comes forth. Duncan Hines, Brenda Caulfield, Jim Cobb meet with him on January 6, 2000. He had a few conditions. He would now provide Ogden Dunes $5 million up front, dumping 500000 cubic yards of sand in the next seven months on Ogden Dunes Beach. But his name would have to be, he's anonymous. No one would know his name. He would meet with only three people, Duncan Hines, Brenda Cofield, and Jim Kopp. We would have to stop all negotiations with the federal government, and we would have to become a gated community so that no one from the outside could come in. So he was promising $5 million immediately to restore the beach, 10 to $15 million over the long term, because he had an offshore account. So this meant that for five months, there would be 500,000 cubic yards of sand carried by 185 truckloads of sand a week, 10 hours a day, six days a week, would be dumped at the end of the easements at an estimated cost of $5 million. An additional 75,000 would be dumped on Portage Beach because we knew it ultimately would come back to us. And so the donors' funds would also guarantee, supposedly, enough money that $100,000 of 100,000 cubic yards of sand would be dumped annually. Now, Heinz, you know, he's, you know, on the one hand, we would look at that and you say, my God, what is a lifesaver? Our, our, we are, we're, we're saved, we're saved. And so, but Heinz you know, also recognized that, well, even if this guy had $15 million in addition to the $5 million, the $15 million would not go as far as 40 or $50 million from the federal government over a long period of time. Because the federal government fund would be, what, annually divvied out. We are in the pipeline forever. This would maybe be 15 million sitting in an offshore account, but maybe after 20 years, that offshore account would be emptied, and where would we be? We would just postpone you know, the inevitable. So Heinz was very, very you know, concerned about, you know, it's a great deal, but should not. Do we give up on the government? So Heinz thought he had a solution. Maybe he could talk the anonymous donor into using the $5 million to buy the Midwest Steel property and build the parking lot over there. And thus, we would be, we would be free, home free. We would get out of the issue of, and the federal government would maybe look kindly on us and supplement the 10 or $15 million in that offshore account over the longer term. Unfortunately, of course, the anonymous donor 
did not agree to that. And so, because the anonymous donor wanted, and Heinz had another problem, the anonymous donor wanted us to become a gated community, which meant that what? We had to take, we would take ownership instead of the state of our roads. The roads would no longer be public roads. They would no longer be supplemented by the gas tax, our share of the gas tax that comes into the town from the state that allows us to repave the roads periodically. And so that if you, you know, if you take the donors and become a gated community, even if it were legal, you could do it, you'd still have the annual upkeep of the roads and every five, seven years, a major upkeep with the resurfacing of those roads. So Heinz had, you know, I mean, on the one hand, he thought the, the deal was, you know, great. On the other hand, he's thinking long term. Now, the, you know, our attorney is saying, here are the options. He's meeting with the Council on the Beach Nourishment Committee in 2000. Negotiate, continue to negotiate with the federal government. Accept the 60 car lot and the bus, because the bus will disappear in the long term. Or get the agreement done with the donor, recognizing it will not cover the long term, and it may be illegal, because the donor had some other issues. He wanted to write all the checks himself. He wanted his sons to deliver the sand. So there were you know, certain conditions that there all of a sudden began to be uh, dropped out in terms of those discussions. Do nothing. The lake levels are going down. But remember, you're still losing $90,000, $100,000 a year, 90,000 cubic yards of sand a year, or 100,000. And long term, the walls will fail. Or continue the lawsuit, but it's going to cost you another 500,000. And if it was su successful, it's going to be five or eight years to wind its, a new lawsuit to wind its way. And you may lose anyway. So these were our, our attorney's uh, recommendations. Now, of course, the press is being bit, picking up on, on this. Our deal with the state has been, our federal government has been delayed. Uh, federal funds are not coming. The beach ball is in the town's court. Uh, the beach proves costly. Ne nearly $600,000 spent without a grain of sand in sight. So, you know, they're, all of a sudden now the press is not too complimentary to. March to May, the council still working on a two lot public access, but there, it's a lost cause because what's happening? The lake level is dropping. The emergency is disappearing. Vesklosky announces he has a new partner, City of Portage. He gets federal money. He had gotten federal money to build the overpass for a safety because that, you recall the South Shore accident that killed a number of people when a uh, South Shore train had hit a truck. And so that was the origins of the overpass into Midwest National Steel. And so since he's gotten the money for the overpass, what it's very easy now for him to get additional money for the city of Portage and for the National Park Service to buy that land from Midwest Steel, and then to create what ultimately was the pavilion, the parking lots that serve the Portage Beach. So at this point, Vesklosky has no interest in a two-car lot, I mean, you know, two-lot <laughs> parking lot in Ogden Dunes in exchange for federal funds. And then within the town itself, there are big divisions between the council and the Beach Nourishment Advisory Committee. Ultimately, because what's happened, the council votes four to one to take the agreement and, and accept the $5 million from the anonymous donor with all the conditions. That means breaking off the discussions with Visklosky and giving up on the federal government. And so what happens then is 
The Beach Nourishment Committee says we need, they didn't trust the donor. And it's not going to be a long-term solution. And they put a lot of work into organizing, trying to get the federal funding. And so what happens is that the, council, the Nourishment Committee rises up in reaction to the council. The council then dissolves beach, the Beach Nourishment Committee. So there's internal divisiveness. And then the press gets wind of the anonymous donor. Who is he? No one knows. Now, O'Connell's giving his last, he's getting off the payroll. Our money is running out, so this is sort of his, not quite his farewell address, but he is saying, you are living on borrowed time. You're like a cancer patient who goes into temporary remission and deludes himself into believing he is cured. The lake levels will rise, storms will come, and the beach again will disappear. So this was sort of his parting words. And he says, you know, what you need to do is give the donor, because the donor now had made this offer, but then all of a sudden he became anonymous, became very quiet, didn't seem to be wanting to discuss or promise any money. So O'Connell says, give the donor 10 days to sign off on the five million. If he's going to deliver, put it up now. And one month to agree to the terms of the long-term trust, the 10, 15, 20 million dollars. But remember that the 10, 15, 20 million dollars is not going to be forever. It's going to disappear at some point. And he says, if the donor doesn't sign off immediately, then go back to Visclosky on bended knees. Take the 60 car plan or whatever else that he wants you, but you need to get into the federal pipeline. Donor pledges five million, the press now goes wild with this. Uh, and then of course the division within the town, you know, that is, makes the press. Bremer and Visclosky believe they were blindsided by the discussions with the anonymous donor. Because all of a sudden they were told, we're not even going to talk, we, we tell them we're not talking to you because we have this good neighbor. And even there was signs of it's going to become a reality. First 60 truckloads of sand was delivered in June, late June. And so maybe it's, this is working, except there has been no signature from the donor. And the town wanted the donor to put up a $100,000 bond, so obviously knowing that trucks are going to destroy the roads. So wanted the donor to put up a $100,000 bond so that there's damage to the roads by the, all these trucks, that the roads would be repaired through that bond. So the press, you know, the benefactor is a mystery. Resident to give 30 million to Ogden Dunes to preserve the shoreline. Then came a lot of dirt. There, a, an article, Gary Dump gets another look. Officials were looking for the owner of the Gary Dump that had, been, had burned up on the west side of Gary, causing all kinds of uh, environmental hazards, et cetera. And, and the paper doesn't identify the anonymous donor, but says Clifford Rowland of Ogden Dunes, who lives on Shore Drive, is the owner of this dump. And he has some connection with the donor. And so, again, now you, all of a sudden you have bad press coming because supposedly all this secrecy in Ogden Dunes is uncovering some other type of scandal. And the donor failed to provide the $100,000 bond. And the council finally voted December 4, 2000 to end its deal with the donor because the donor came through with nothing except maybe, I don't know how many loads of sand, 15, 20 truckloads of sand, 30 truckloads of sand that were delivered in June, but that was it. Duncan Hines, exhausted by the stalemate, resigned. So there was continued efforts, uh, going, hoping, but of course what's happening, the lake level is going down. 
But Ogden Dunes did get its stoplight. So that was part of the deal originally with the state and with uh, the Sklosky, and it came through. At least we got, we got a new entrance. So we have in the spring of 2001 the end of the two sagas. The saga of federal funds, the saga of an anonymous donor. Lake levels decline, the crisis had disappeared, our hope of federal funding had disappeared, uh, residents wished to push, put the divisiveness behind them, the courts had rejected the last of our lawsuits, the Rupert lot, the Two Shore Drive would be sold and a ho large home built on it. And Ms. Klosky then, of course, had th that new plan, that new deal with Portage, the $3 million for purchasing land from Midwest Steel, giving it to the National Park Service, and as well as some of it to Portage Beach, for, I mean to the town of Portage, creating the Portage Beach, the pavilion, uh, the river walk, the parking areas. 2001, 2010, life is good. The Portage Beach had a lot of sand due to the dredging, it was supplemented by NIPSCO, the literal Drift did its work. All that sand that went down to that was dumped on Portage came to Ogden Dunes. Sand dunes, sand bluffs appeared. All the groins were buried. Even the steel walls were buried in sand. The rock revetments were buried. Uh, and so we had 10 years, came and went without a threat. It was a decade without a beach crisis. And you could see. What happened? Here was that empty lot down there. Here, 2005, the new home. This photo is not a, you can't, but uh, this photo has deer. You see the beach there at Two Shore Drive, but the little things by the home in the background there are deer. The deer were enjoying uh, the large beach. March of 2014, this was our beach. Then the cycle reappears, beginning in 2014, batters the beaches in 2016, 2017, lake levels 10 inches higher, uh, Portage Riverfront Walk was uh, closed down for a while, the pavilion was almost seen as might be going to be washed away. Uh, and then, of course, most recently, if you've been down to the Portage Beach, it has reappeared because there has been the last six weeks, two months, there has been dredging. 2020, our Beach Nourishment Committee is active. Residents are donating funds to cover legal expenses, uh, but obviously nowhere close to $500,000 needed for major lawsuits. Shore Drive owners are spending thousands of dollars to reinforce steel walls and rock revetments. As I mentioned, the Army Corps and the National Park Service are dredging sand to repeal the Portage Beach. And then the literal drift is working for Miller. This is in 2020 this year. You can see this is the early stages of the loss of our protecting walls. You can see the storm damage. Our, even the steel walls are weakened. The beginnings of the rock revetment projects that's still ongoing. You see the major rock revetments. You see the dredging, the last two or three weeks, the dredging machine off of the Portage Beach. And then the shoreline, the beach, is being st slowly restored through that slurry system uh, from, the dredge, from the dredging. I mentioned this last time. Uh, Al Johnson said the building had been torn down, but this was the beach house or the changing house down on the end of Lake Street in Miller. And uh, the house, I think, I think the building has disappeared, but we were down there uh, in April and you could see the sand accumulating. So I mean, at the end of Lake Street, you used to, used to have this little you know, changing and, and, and beach house and you had a parking lot, you had a boat ramp, those are all covered with sand, and there's even now interdunal, uh, I mean, uh, you're even creating interdunal ponds because you have so much sand uh, So uh, down in Miller. So 
Sand leaves Ogden Dunes and has found a new home in Miller. I want to thank all those who have made this event possible and all those who are continuing to contribute to fighting to protect our beach and our homes. And I especially like to thank Dan uh, for all the work that he has done. So thank you very much. With that, I uh, thank you for attending and uh, thank you for all the support that you've given uh, the town and the Beach Nourishment Committee currently in terms of trying to address the issues that uh, continue to face us. Thank you.